Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 57 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So this week's show is an encore episode. I am sharing with you again my interview with Tracy Beeble, who is a therapist and a parenting coach in Portland, Oregon. And I interviewed Tracy way back in episode 6, so the sound quality wasn't quite as good back then. I'm still trying to kind of get the swing of interviewing, um, so it's kind of interesting to go back and listen. But um, I wanted to share it with you again because I've been thinking a lot about how um, how many important things I think Tracy had to say and how many useful and helpful things to us as parents. And I originally approached her because I had received a question from a listener um, actually a widowed mom of a son, and her husband had died when her son was quite small, uh, and now the boy was you know, approaching puberty and wondering um, what she needed to know, what she needed to do, how are things going to change up now that he was moving from little kid phase to teenage boy phase, um, and specifically questions around, you know, I, I broadened it for Tracy, um, you know, moms raising sons and dads raising daughters. And I knew that Tracy would be just the person to talk to about this. Um, And as I expected, she had lots of good things to say, so I'd encourage you to take a listen. But it was broader than that, too. Um, General discussion about this whole thing about um, connecting with kids as they move into the teenage years, um, keeping those lines of communications open. She has something she calls the mom PSA, um, which I think is is a really good idea, and I've been trying to do that. Um, And something else came up, and it's around this topic of... um, this idea that it's not your kid's job to manage your emotions. So be sure to listen for that part of the discussion as well, because I think that Tracy was really, really insightful on that point. And it's a, you know, something that I hadn't necessarily thought about, um, you know, quite so clearly as she states it. And I think it really helped me to understand, um, about that topic. So, um, I hope you enjoy my discussion with Tracy Beeble. My guest today is social worker Tracy Beeble, who is joining us from her home office in Portland, Oregon. Tracy, welcome. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to ask you to start, um, if you would please, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Yeah, so I'm a clinical social worker, which basically means I'm a therapist um, and coach in Portland. I work with families and kids and couples um, in all kinds of um, scenarios. I do a lot of parent parent work. And I do workshops, I do classes um, in schools and other places. Um, And I also have a a podcast, so we can talk about that later. Um, But yeah, I just work with kids and families in all kinds of different situations. Okay. And um, just for our listeners, um, I know you're both a biological and adoptive mom. You have a daughter... A daughter and a son. You have a high schooler and a middle schooler. I do. And, yeah. And yeah, so I'm a parent of us, um, almost 13 and 16 year old. My okay. son is older. He's a sophomore in high school, and he is biological. And then my daughter is adopted from China. Yeah. Very good. Very and so, good. lots of personal experience as well as um, lots and lots of experience in yes. coaching and practicing with families. Yep. Um, fantastic. Okay. Well, I'm very excited you're here today. I've gotten a really great question from a listener. Um, and, but I thought we'd tee up the discussion, actually, by reading a letter um, that someone wrote in to the columnist, Ask Amy, recently. Great. And it's actually on this topic, um, so I'm, I'll be interested for your, uh, your reaction to this letter. Um, so this person says, Dear Amy, I am a physician and a widower. Most importantly, I'm the father of a brilliant and deeply inquisitive 12-year-old girl. I have raised my daughter by myself since she was six months old. We are very close. I noticed signs that she would soon be experiencing puberty, and I knew that she would have lots of questions. I had a series of talks with her about things like hormones, body changes, romantic relationships, and safe sex. Before I started each of these conversations, I told her that if she was uncomfortable talking to her dad about this, I would be happy to arrange it so she could talk to her doctor, who's a woman, or any of the other wonderful women I've worked hard to have in her life. My daughter told me she would rather talk to me about these personal things. Okay, so far so good, right? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, I got a call from my daughter's health teacher at her school, furious that I had, quote, dared to discuss menstrual products with my child. The teacher called it, quote, tantamount to child abuse, 
that a male person, even a father, had discussed these things with a 12-year-old. Amy, I know the information I gave my girl was correct, and I gave it to her in as objective, non-sensational, and supportive way as I could. Was I out of line here? Should I have left this conversation to my daughter's pediatrician? And he signs it, Worried Widower. Oh, gosh. Well, I just got, uh, I just got super frustrated with that uh, teacher. Yes, yes. <laughs> because here's what I'm thinking. Um, why does the information have to be gendered? Mm -hmm. We are sharing information about bodies. And when we make it gendered or we make it like mom can only talk about these things and dad can only talk about these things, we give that kiddo the message that what's going on with her body is a taboo subject, is shameful, there's something wrong with it, it's super private, and you can only talk about it with women. How is that young girl supposed to go out in the world and feel confident and comfortable with her body? Chances are, um, odds tell us, that most likely she is going to have a sexual relationship with a man. Maybe not, we don't know. Maybe, maybe she's bisexual or, or gay, um, but either way, for her, if she does have a sexual relationship with a man one day, how is she ever going to be comfortable talking to him about her body? How is she going to be comfortable with consent? How is she going to be comfortable with her own sexual pleasure and confidence in her own body when we give her a message that um, the things that are going on with her body are gendered and only to be talked about in the women club? <laughs> yeah, I think that is just um, so misguided. Yeah. And instead of supporting this dad who is giving his child just information about her body. I mean, you know, he can talk to her about airplanes and basketball, but he can't talk to her about her body. <laughs> right. That's her dad. I know. And that and he as he says, they've been very close. It's it's been the two of them since she was six months old. I mean Yeah. It sounds to me like he is really on the ball with this and, and thoughtful in handling it. Well, I, I was pleased to see that Amy's answer was that the teacher was completely out of line Yes, and that the dad was on the right track here and encouraging yeah. him to continue. Um, Agreed. And the other thing I think about is whether you have a one household family with a mom and a dad or a two household family with a mom and a dad. So you've gotten two different households into cases of divorce or separation, or say you have same sex parents and you have two dads raising a daughter. Mm -hmm. We need parents to be able to give kids information. I know for myself, I'm in a two-household family, so I'm, I'm divorced, and my kids share time between their dad and me, and my daughter has her period at his house. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking about that, uh, she was like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I can talk to dad about this. And I was like, sweetheart, dad knows about periods. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. No bodies work, and it's just information. And so you're going to have to figure out how to talk to dad about this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so I actually sent him an email saying, hey, um, we just had a conversation that she was feeling uncomfortable talking to you about this. If she doesn't bring it up, um, why don't you bring it up? And he was like, oh, yeah, on it. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll bring that up. And gratefully, he and I have a you know good relationship and, and we can do that um, mm -hmm. with each other. Not everyone does. But for my daughter, she gets two parents who normalize the fact that she has periods. Right. Right. She supplies for that and she needs to be able to talk about it. So right. I think that that teacher is so misguided and we make this so gendered. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I talk to parents a lot. I'm like, moms need to talk to boys about sex and bodies and dads need to talk to girls about sex and bodies because we mm -hmm. need to be comfortable talking about these things. Because again, we're going to be in sexual situations one day. Um, our kids are going to be hopefully because that's part of being a healthy human and mm -hmm. we want them to be able to openly talk about what's going on with their body with other people mm -hmm. um, because that's how they're going to be healthy people so mm -hmm. yeah totally misguided this dad was totally on the right track yeah yeah okay thank you I yeah I couldn't believe when I read this and I uh yeah okay um so that brings us then to a question that I got from a listener um which I think is a fantastic question and really um you know, practical question that I think many, um, you know, a parent who's widowed may very likely face. It's on the same theme. Um, so here's the question. Uh, she said, I'm a widowed mom of a fifth grade son. As he gets older, these are a few of the things I've been thinking about. And I think we'll just go, she's got four questions. We'll just go through them and then we'll kind of circle back. And Great. So um, number one, how to give your child of the opposite sex good advice that they can relate to and use. 
Number two, how to stay connected as your child is maturing and becoming more independent. Number three, how to talk to your child of the opposite sex about body-related topics, parentheses, puberty. Number four, how to date when your child is too old to have a babysitter and too young to be home alone for long. And then I'm going to throw in another somewhat related question from a different listener who's also a widowed mom. She said she would like tips on finding mentors for her boys. And I believe she said she has two or three boys in the middle school and high school range. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, let's, let's take these one at a time here. Um, how about, let's start with this one. How to stay connected as your child is maturing and becoming more independent? Uh, that is just a universal question. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The, the world gets bigger and they're out in it more. I think the key is we have to seek them out. You know, when they were little, we were like, oh my gosh, when am I going to get some space and time? They keep looking <laughs> out for everything. Uh -huh. And when they get older, and it's our turn to seek them out. And mm. I think some of the things are making sure that we're doing things that they're interested in. We're talking about the things they're interested in. And we're sharing more of our lives with them. Um, you mm. know, as we get older, we get to tell them more about what's going on with us. Mm. Here so that... They're like, oh, this is how this goes. You share some about you. I can share some about me. Instead of just trying to dig and get things about them, mm -hmm. things about you. You know, your feelings. Your, I mean, we don't, you know, we obviously don't, don't want to give them responsibility for our feelings or what's going on. But we can say things like, whew, I had a stressful day today. This happened and then that happened. Um, I'm really glad to just be home hanging out with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Like little things or as your world gets bigger and you have more freedom to do things, go do things that are exciting for you and then share them with your children. Mm. Ask them things they would like to do. Go, you know, have um, adventures with them. Go do something novel with them. Go find, you know, escape room things to do together or, or whatever. And if they drag their feet and really are like, I don't want to go, you're like, I know, that's all right. We're still going. I don't know if it'll be fun or not. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, uh -huh. I'm a big fan of not selling something for more than it is. It's going to be fun. Don't you want to spend time with us? Uh -huh. um, hey, I want to spend time with you, and I thought we'd try this adventure. I have no idea if it'll be fun or not. Mom, it's so irritating. I know. It's all right. Let's go anyway. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Being silly, seeking them out in their room, and making sure that we're not just being task-oriented and logistics-oriented. Mm. Like, you need to do this thing. How's your homework? What are your things? Are you doing? Have you gotten all your stuff done? We tend to like get very task oriented, especially mm -hmm. with kids. Mm -hmm. Forget to be silly with them. Forget to tackle them on the couch. Uh -huh. Forget to, you know, dance and be ridiculous in the kitchen with them. Forget that they're fun. Mm -hmm. and, so also, yeah. Well, I'm, 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 as you're speaking, I'm thinking of the typical question, how was your day? Fine, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Fine, and then that shuts down, right? Yeah. So what do you think? Like, is there I share something about my day instead of asking them. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I saw the funniest thing today, blank, blank, blank. Anything mm -hmm. funny happened to you today? Oh, okay. Or, um, anything super ridiculous happened at school today? Or, you know, um, I, you know, like sharing something and then asking, but engaging mm -hmm. them first instead of putting them on the spot and requiring something of them, I try mm -hmm. and do something. Okay. Okay, cool. And something in there you mentioned, um, sharing something about how you're feeling like my day was so frustrating. Um, and you cautioned though against making them responsible for your feelings. I forget how you said it, but can you talk a little more about that and what that might look like that you should avoid? Yeah, so you don't want to say things like, I had a really frustrating day, so I need you to be extra nice to me. Mm. No, okay. no, that's not the deal. Okay. Right? Instead, what you're modeling is, I had a really frustrating day today, and I'm still dealing and handling things and showing emotional maturity, right? Okay. It's not their job to make you feel better. It's not their job to do anything for you, actually. It's their job to be responsible for the things they're responsible for, but it's not their job to manage any of your emotions or take care of you or do any of that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can certainly share what's going on with you. And then you get to say, um, and it's not your job to take care of that. I'm just letting you know how my day went. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I love that. that thank you. Um, 
Okay, let's go to the next question here. Um, how to give your child of the opposite sex good advice that they can relate to and use? And I'm not sure if this, because the, there's a separate question specifically about the puberty and body related topics. So I'm wondering if this is maybe more about, what's that? I think those are kind of a combo question. Okay. The, so because what I would say is good advice is good advice. Mm. It, it's not gendered, mm -hmm. right? I, mm -hmm. I think that we can say like, I have a female body and you have a male body. So some of the things are different, but a lot of the things are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we run into all kinds of things about our bodies. We, you know, hear how things work and men can understand women's bodies and how they work and women can understand men's bodies and how they work. That doesn't have to be gendered. Mm -hmm. The experience of being in that body is not the same, but honestly, my experience of being in my female body and my daughter's experience of being in her female body aren't the same either. Mm. So I don't think we have to know exactly the same experience as someone to be able to connect with them about the experience of getting comfortable with your body as it changes, um, experiencing all those changes and how weird that feels of being in that middle ground of not being a little kid anymore, but not being an adult anymore either as your body is shifting and changing. None of that is gendered. Right. So I, I think a lot of that, we can just meet them where they are in terms of expressing these are changes that start happening. And I think a lot of times we focus so much on the physical changes and we don't talk about how that impacts the emotions and the social stuff that goes on. And all of that we can talk about that's not about penises or vaginas. Mm -hmm. like, that's about the experience of having different feelings going on, having crushiness happen, feeling like you want to touch somebody else's body but not doing it, and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. Those aren't gendered. Mm -hmm. we, we make them gendered, but they're really not. When it comes right down to it, yeah. So, yeah, I think that we can just talk about the experience of growing and changing. And then there are so many books out there that are really great. Like for younger kids, I really love that it's not the stork, it's so amazing, and it's perfectly normal series. Those are so great for ages four to ten, or okay. ten and up, actually. There's three books. They're really, really good. And then some of the other books I like are the What's Happening to My Body book for girls and What's Happening to My Body book for boys. All of those are still pretty heteronormative. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to add, add some pieces in for that to talk about the, the fuller range because we just haven't caught up yet. And those are slightly <laughs> older books. But they're really, really good, and they're jumping off points. And they're saying, like, here's a book with a bunch of information in it. I've read the book, so I know everything in here. Mm -hmm. Nothing in here is going to surprise me. I know all the words in here. I know all the things in here. But I thought you might want some privacy to read through it on your own. If you have any questions, nothing in here is going to surprise me. Mm. Okay. Um, and so I... I think that's helpful. And then another book that I really like for parents is called For Goodness Sex. And it, it talks about, it's not about the, um, the physical stuff of changing and sex. It's not the mechanics so much as it is the experience of helping our children grow into healthy sexual beings who are comfortable um, managing their own pleasure and consent and talking to other people about their sex, sex and sexuality and getting comfortable with that with themselves and how to help kids do that. I think it's a really good one for helping us wrap our heads around how to have those conversations with kids. Okay. And what, um, and, I'll, and I'll put all these books in the show notes for yeah. sure, because these are excellent. What, um, the, the last book that you mentioned, um, when your kids are what age would be the right time for you to start reading that book as a parent? Two. Two. <laughs> okay. we, I mean, really, right. Sex and sexuality and talking about sex and sexuality starts when we change the first diaper. Mm. We watch our face and how comfortable we are. Like, are, does, it, does our face scrunch up because it's gross to clean mm. their poop and their pee? Mm -hmm. And we distract them from it. Are we okay with them putting their hands down their pants? Are we okay naming all the parts what they are? Or do we call them the down theirs or the private parts? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, they get such clear messages from us when we don't even know we're giving them about sex and sexuality and bodies. Mm -hmm. so the conversation does not start at puberty. Ideally, this conversation starts with the first diaper change. Okay. So, and, yeah. Well, and so what about, what if somebody's playing catch up now? Like what if they didn't start with the first diaper change and now they're oh, kidding? Fine. So then I think for those kids, you know, you read some information and you say to them, you know, 
we haven't talked much about sex and bodies and all this stuff. And I, I feel like I'm a little behind on talking to you about it. And it might feel weird to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not super comfortable talking about it, but I'm, I'm working on it because it's important for me to give you this information. I think for older kids, they feel our discomfort. So just say that we're uncomfortable. Mm. If you're uncomfortable, say it. And, and say, that kind of neutralizes it. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable about this, um, but, uh, but I, I wish I wasn't because what I want is for this to be a comfortable topic, but with my parents, it never was. So I don't know how to do this. I'm making it up as I go. Mm -hmm. you need to be real. I think that's the beauty of older kids. Right. They know when you're not being real. So just be real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, say it. just say, I am not sure exactly how to talk to you about this, but I think it's important that I do. So I'm going to try and it might feel weird. Here goes. And so, okay. So then your kid might have, various reactions but you could maybe group them into reluctantly going along with the discussion or yeah. flat out refusing yeah so I also think this is not a one-time sit-down lecture i mm -hmm. call it sprinkling we okay. should be sprinkling, sprinkling in this information i do things in my house like oh hey um mom psa um condoms are still the best way to prevent sexually transmitted um diseases which we now actually call sexually transmitted infections uh. No, um, they're not STDs anymore. They're actually STIs. Um, but anyway, condoms are important, but they're, but they're also, you know, not perfect. Mm -hmm. and like, thanks, mom. Like, okay, that's it. any questions? No. Okay, uh -huh. done, moving on. And you're saying this at a random time, like, yes. like while you're setting the table or something. Yep, or... totally. Or mm -hmm. we're in the car talking about something else. I'm like, oh, you know what just came into my mind? And I remember, <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, you want to make sure you change your tampons. Um, regularly, you can get toxic shock syndrome. Uh -huh. um, and, Bear, and the older, the boy is like, wait, what's that? Uh -huh. like, oh, well, that's this thing. And my daughter's like, oh my God, mom. <laughs> I'm like, this is just important information, you guys. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What it says is, there's never a bad time to bring it up. You don't have to wait for a perfect time. And it doesn't have to be a big, long discussion or conversation. Mm -hmm. You're sprinkling it in. So mm -hmm. not overwhelming them or you with information. And I think you're maybe saying that even if they say, oh, stop, they're still uh -huh. getting something. They sure are. And the biggest thing they're getting is my mom can say these words out loud. My dad can say these words out loud. Mm -hmm. We say these words out loud at my house. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. My mom just said Venus. That is super weird. Okay. <laughs> All right. Right. <laughs> My mom just said whatever. Uh -huh. And that's important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. Um, all right. Here's a, a slight shift in gears. Um, but this person had also asked how to date when your child is too old to have a babysitter and too young to be home alone for long. Yeah, I get that. So I think... Um, actually, so I'll say I have a blog post called, um, yes, your child, your children can handle your dating life, hmm. which I think might be, I'll, I'll send you the link after and you oh, can please do. Yeah. That one. Um, because kids can, they really can handle your dating life. And I think if you've got kids old enough to know that you're dating, you tell them you're dating. Mm. You, here's what dating is. Mm -hmm. right? You define it. You know, it's two adults spending time together to see if they'd like to spend more time together. Uh -huh. <laughs> right uh -huh. and it's a person that's more than a friend it's somebody you might have crushy feelings for hmm. right um and then as you get to know them more you might and then i think for those kids that can't stay home alone long if you want to go on a longer date set up a sleepover for them at a friend's house mm. mm -hmm. right so that they're just not home and you don't have to worry about it and they're doing something fun too mm -hmm. or you tell the person that you're dating this is my window of time i have mm -hmm. right and you tell your kid that you're going out on a date. You're transparent about it. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to tell them all the dirty details. You don't have to tell them all the stuff. And what you get to tell them is sometimes you go out on a date and you only go out with a person one or two times and you don't see them again. Mm -hmm. So if there's someone that I'm dating that I decide I've dated long enough that I'd like them to introduce you to them, I'll tell you more about them. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm just going out and meeting people. And here's what dating is. Because... Mm -hmm. One of the pluses of having a single parent who's dating is kids get a window into what dating looks like. Ah. 
one of the downsides of that is kids get a window into what dating looks like. <laughs> right? uh-huh. there's, there's both sides of that, but it's really about how you handle it and how you decide to tell your kids about it. Um, and you get to be honest about dating. Mm-hmm. To point, right? And they don't need all the nitty gritty details. Yeah. And you mentioned if they're old enough to know that you're dating, like what, so I guess you're not going to tell your two-year-old. Maybe you're just no. going to say, I'm going out for the evening. I'll be back at whatever time. But, yep. um, but you know, your six-year-old, your 10-year-old, your, well, like, what are we talking no, about? I mean, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. you just tell them different information because the four-year-old is going to be like, so the four-year-old would get to know you're dating if it's someone that you've, you're dating enough that you want to tell them, oh, you know, this person, Tom, I'm going out with, I've kind of, I've talked about him before. He's the one with, remember I told you he has that white dog, mm-hmm. uh, that's really nice named Fluffy, um, <laughs> you know, and we're going to go see a movie tonight mm-hmm. and then um, later. Well, what color hair does he have? What kind of jacket does he wear? What does he wear sneakers? Right? Mm-hmm. Like those are the kinds of questions for year olds. Right. Ask. Does right. he have a house? Where does he live? What kind of car does he have? Right? Like, mm-hmm. and then you can tell the four year old those things. If you're just going out on a date um, and it's with like a new person, first or second date, your four-year-old doesn't need to know that you're going on a date. Your four-year-old mm-hmm. needs to know, I'm going out with a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going out to dinner. We're going out to dinner. Oh, what's your friend's name? Tom? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. How do you know Tom? Oh, well, we met, you know, mm-hmm. and now we're going out together. Oh, okay. Right. Like, right. You get to tell them stuff, but you don't have to tell them all the things and you just don't make any promises and then at some point if you're dating long enough that you feel like you want to introduce your kids to this person because you think it's going to go on longer then you incrementally do that and then you know a 10 year old gets to know more right the jazz yeah like a little bit more of like yeah um like well where are you going tonight oh i'm going out with this person named tom mm-hmm. um well, how do you know him well we've gone on a few dates well, what does that mean well it means we're deciding whether we want to go on more dates do you kiss him and then if you do you can say yeah sometimes oh that's weird it feels weird when you're 10 it doesn't feel weird when you're a grown-up mm. right? and mm-hmm. you, you know it feels weird and kind of gross until your body's ready for it but then when you're a grown-up that kind of thing feels good oh really <laughs> yeah and then my kids were like or like older teenagers I was like totally or older teenagers that's the mm. kind of teenagers do mm-hmm. you get to start teaching them what your values are what your beliefs about dating, how you go about dating, how you go about getting to know someone, ideally slow and steady wins the race on that, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're showing your kids how you do that. And you're showing them that you're willing to be vulnerable and take a risk to put yourself out there. And you're just going out, really dating can just be going spending time with someone mm-hmm. and putting something out and doing something for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think when you're a single parent, that's harder. And you feel like, oh, I'm going out and spending someone else instead of spending time with my kids. But, you know, there's a time when you're ready for it that you want to do that. And you want that for yourself. And you want that kind of energy and that kind of comfort and that kind of connection with someone else. And that feeds you in a way that then gives back to your children. Too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think... You know, I don't think there's, you, I'm sure, you know, you can Google, is dating okay with kids? And you'll hear a million different things of advice, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I don't think any of them are, com- well, there's, you know, on the edges, there's right and wrong, I think. Mm-hmm. But it's, still, it's like, it's all just advice and different mm-hmm. ideas. And you have to decide what's right for you and what's right for your kids. It's an art, not a science. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that if you're honest and open, again, not with all the details, um, but I think kids need to see us be adults and they mm-hmm. need to see us um, try things and put ourselves out there and be willing to, um, to love again. Mm-hmm. That's important that they get to see that. Yeah. Um, okay. And so I think, you know, you decide how much information you, you give them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, and then the question from the other widowed mom that had written in, um, the one with two or three boys in the kind of middle school, high school range, and she said she wanted some tips on finding mentors for her boys, and the father had passed away. Yeah, I think that one is tricky, right? Because um, I think a lot of times it's, it's for the 
for the kids to find some of that in teachers and coaches and other people. But then that's where you get to encourage relationships. If you have family, you get to say to uncles or brother-in-laws or grandpas or other people like, hey, would you be up for cultivating a closer relationship with, you know, Jimmy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I want him to have, you know, he, he doesn't have a, you know, that parent that mm -hmm. dad figure in his life. And I'd like him to have someone close or mm -hmm. closer in our family that could, you know, continue that relationship. So I think that's for you, the parent to approach someone in the family that you think could be open to it or a close friend or someone and say, would you be up for that? Mm -hmm. And then you say to your kiddo, Hey, um, I was talking to uncle Jimmy the other day and he said, he'd really like to get to know you a little bit better. Would you be up for that? Mm hmm. Because okay. when your kids are older, they have to consent to that relationship too. Well, that's what I was gonna was thinking as you were talking. Like, if your kid is four, yes. you can say, "Hey, Uncle Jimmy's taking you to wherever tonight," and yep. you know, and you can send them along. Yep. But what about when your kid is twelve, fifteen? You know, mm -hmm. and and maybe there is Uncle Jimmy who says, "Hey, do you want to go to the baseball game?" No. Hey, do you mm -hmm. want to do this? No. Hey, mm -hmm. you know, what do you? What, how do you? I think that's where you have the conversation with the 12 year old and you say, Hey, uncle Jimmy's reaching out. Do you know why? No. Well, you know, dad died and he's not around. And, um, it's important to have men and women in your life that are adults that you spend time with, um, because you get different kinds of things out of those relationships. And so uncle Jimmy's trying, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And, you may not want to go, um, but I'd like you to give it a shot mm -hmm. and just see. And maybe you could talk to him about something you actually want to do. If you don't want to go to the baseball game, I'll bet he'd be up for doing something else. Mm -hmm. What would you want to do? Let's talk to him. Mm -hmm. well, Mom, it's just I don't want to. Like, I get that. But let's think about it, right? He's your uncle, and he's offering getting together. What do you not like about it? What, what's not fun about him? What's like, that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they say, I'd rather just hang out with my friends. And you get to say, okay, that's all right. And then you talk to Uncle Jimmy and you say, hey, he's kind of pushing back. Um, what do you think? Right? You want to give it a little time? Why don't you come over this weekend? I'll invite you over. We'll all play a game. We'll go do something. Right? Then it's your job to be like, hey, Uncle Jimmy come spend more time with us, mm -hmm. not just with that kid, right? So mm -hmm. then Uncle Jimmy's around more. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah, cool. We can go do something. But yeah. I, you can't force it. I mean, you can force it, but usually if you force a 12 to 18-year-old kid to do something, they just dig their heels in. There's mm -hmm. something you have to. You're the parent. You get to set limits on some things. But like cultivating a relationship with Uncle Jimmy, that's hard to force. Mm hmm yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. And really, um, it's not the kid's job to seek that. It's Uncle Jimmy's job to cultivate that. Hmm. Right. It, it's it. The, the onus is on the adult. Right. To right. Meet the kid where they are, not have the kid meet Uncle Jimmy where he is. However, you can talk about the importance of that relationship and encourage the kid to open their mind to the possibility. And he's like, I don't want. It's not dad. I just. I don't want. I don't need a dad. I've had mm. one. And that's not my dad. It's like, oh, Uncle Jimmy's not trying to be your dad. Mm -hmm. you, you did have a dad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, nobody's going to take that place of dad. Uncle Jimmy's not trying to take the place of dad. He just wants to be your uncle mm -hmm. and know you better. Mm -hmm. Be closer to you, just as an uncle. Yeah. Right? yeah. Nobody's taking the place of dad. Because sometimes kids, depending on how old they were, when their parent died, they can feel a loyalty. Mm. And they don't, and they feel like they are not being loyal to the other parent when they are, you know, doing dad things with somebody else. Right. Right. So yeah. You have to be like, yeah. dad actually would have wanted you to go hang out with uncle Jimmy. He would have been fine with that. Even if dad was still here, he'd be down with you hanging out with uncle Jimmy. Uh -huh. So it's, if you're worried about that, or feeling weird about that. I know dad pretty well. And I know that wouldn't be a thing he'd be worried about. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. I, this is this is a really useful discussion. I'm I'm very excited to bring this to the listeners because <laughs> this is you're just full of so many <laughs> wise wise insights and um yeah I could keep talking to you all day about this. Um, <laughs> I do want to circle back to the puberty topic um, yeah. before we run out of time here. Um, I know in some well in my community for example there's a class and it's called Great Expectations and mm-hmm. it's run at, at the Seattle Children's Hospital and I think they're in multiple cities. But I assume, you know, other cities may have similar offerings. Um, and it's basically a puberty class. And um, they they have a girls class and they have a boys class, two mm-hmm. separate, um, you know, different, totally different schedules. And they talk about changes in bodies and practical things like tampons and um, relationships and all kinds of things. And in addition to imparting some basic information, and, and they give you a, a book as well along with it, um, they're trying to really set the groundwork for the parent and child in the home then to continue the discussion. And one of the things I've observed, um, typically, for example, I took my daughter to the girls class yeah, and it was an auditorium and it was all like 11 year old girls and women. Yeah. And they, d- and I, I've heard that the boys class is the same with all dads. Yeah, so and they did say that, um, you know, sometimes they get a mom in the boys class or a dad in the girls uh-huh. class and that it's totally fine. Um, but it's not the norm. And it stands out. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, you know, let's say you've got now a, a mom raising a boy or a dad raising a girl, yep. um, like the, the column we started out with in the yeah. beginning. Um, you know, and the other parent has died and now your kid is 10, 11 and you've got a chance to go to the puberty class. What do you do? You go. Yeah. You just full on go. Here's what I think about that class too. I think it's unfortunate that both parents aren't taking the kid to both classes. Mm. If you've got a mom and a dad in a family, why aren't you both taking your daughter to that class? Mm. Or why aren't you both taking your son to that class? I'd like to see that expanded. Yeah. You're saying if both parents take the kiddo, you're saying, hey, this is important information and both of us want you to have it. And we want you to know that both of us have this information. So mm-hmm. then if you've got just a mom or just a dad taking a kiddo, um, it, you know, it, it, the gender doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Because the auditorium mean. is full of moms and dads. And, and dads. In, right. right. And what that says to everybody in there, because if you're a boy or you're a girl and you're looking around and you're getting this information, then you're looking around and being like, oh, clearly this is just for girls. Mm. Oh, clearly this is just for boys. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's about people and bodies and humans. Mm -hmm. And we want kids to be able to have that information from both parents. So that's not the norm. That's not how the class (laughs) runs. That's not what's happening. Uh I wish for that. So in the situation that it's actually in, I think you say to your kid of the opposite gender, you say, Hey, I've heard about this class. Um, it's, it's important information. And I think we should go. I think what you'll notice when we're there is it's mostly dads bringing their sons or girls bringing their, or moms bringing their girls. Um, and I think that's too bad because I think that it's important information for everybody. So I'm really glad that you and I can go together. Um, you know, if, and I think I would say, you know, even if dad were here or even if mom were here, I think I'd really like for us all to go together. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I'm excited to go with you. It might feel a little weird because they're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, but I'm excited to like take on the weird with you. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Normalize it from your family. Right. And so when you go, it's not like, oh, I'm the kid whose dad is dead that's here with my mom. Instead, right. like, um, oh, I'm the kid whose parents would be weird and probably both come to this regardless. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and how about if you, you know, if you missed the class, you're, you know, the, the timing of the death of the parent was such yeah. that the parent already went, you know, the kid already went with their same gender parent. And then that parent died, and now it's you and the kid. So you right. kind of missed the boat yourself on the class. I would say to the kid, hey, I realized I missed the boat on that class. Do you remember stuff you learned that you think I should know? And then they say, no, mom, I don't want to talk about it. And you say, I get that. Um, but this is just important stuff to talk about. 
And if, if dad were still here, um, I would ask him too, so that we could all talk about it. Um, but he's not. So, um, if you don't remember the stuff in the class or you feel weird talking to me about it, um, I probably know a lot of the stuff they talked about just because I know stuff about bodies. <laughs> and so um, I just want to, you know, and um, even when you and dad went, the, you know, your body has changed since then. Mm -hmm. And you're probably experiencing some of the things they talked about in the class that, um, that you hadn't yet. So that's something we need to catch up on. And I just want to touch base with you and let you know I'm a resource. And I say to my kids, I'm like, you know, there might be some new words for things that I didn't know about, but I think at this point in my life, it would be hard to shock or surprise me with anything about bodies or sex. Uh -huh. I've heard most things. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think you've heard something that I haven't heard before, please let me know. Uh -huh. But I doubt it. Uh -huh. I doubt it. So there's a lot of exciting and fun and weird stuff out there. I've probably heard of most of it. Right, right. Um, so, you know, I remember when my son, who's now almost 16, it was like two years ago and he was said something, he's like, Oh, cards against humanity. I was like, wait, how do you know about that game? He's like, I've played. I was like, what? Hmm. Like, you know, all the stuff on the cards. He's like, yeah. I was like, I had to look things up. You knew what they were. Huh. Yeah. I was like, okay, well, huh. you're further along than I thought you were. He's like, well, you know, <laughs> so I think they know stuff that we don't even know they know. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think when we're having the conversation, I think that, you know, for that one, you're just like, Hey, I know you and your dad went to that. Um, now it's time to follow up and talk about those things. And here's some more information, um, mm -hmm. here's some books, here's some stuff. And it's hard to shock me because mm -hmm. I'm growing up and I've heard, heard most things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sadly, we are reaching the end of our time today. Oh, we could sure. there's so much on this topic that's so fascinating, but I think that this discussion has shed light on so much of it. So thank Great. you so much. Um, I, I want to end with just one question. Uh, if you could say just one thing to widowed parents on this topic of parenting kids through puberty, what would you, uh, what would you want to leave them with? You have all the tools inside you to do it. You, you, you're the perfectly imperfect parent to do this with your kiddo. Just talk about it. Just say something. Just just open the door. That's all you have to do. Just start. Just, just start. Yeah. Start anywhere and start awkwardly. And yeah. don't feel like you have to have it perfect because none of us do. Okay. I think that's a great place to end. Um, awesome. I my guest today is Tracy Beeble, social worker and therapist in Portland, Oregon, who coaches parents and families in her practice there. Um, Tracy, where can listeners find you if they would like to learn more about your work? Yeah, you can find me at practicalparentingpdx.com, practicallivingpdx.com, and on iTunes podcast at Curiouser and Curiouser Podcast. Very good. And we'll put all those links in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Jenny. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Tracy Beeble as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 57. And so I, I'm continuing to work on the Widowed Parent Handbook here. And specifically right now, I'm working on the outline for that. Um, so thank you very much to the listeners who have written in to tell me what they would expect to see or what they would love to see in uh, covered in such a book. Um, it's not too late to write in. I'm still tweaking things. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea what I want to cover, but I do want to make sure that it's really useful and covers the um, questions and topics and issues that you as a widowed parent would expect to find in such a book. Uh, so please do shoot me an email, jenny at jennylisk.com, J-E-N-N-Y at J-E-N-N-Y-L-I-S-K dot com, and uh, let me know what you'd like me to cover in there. Uh, uh, wind up today with a couple of shout outs here. First of all, a uh, shout out to all my listeners in the UK and Australia and Canada. Uh, so glad to have you here. And of course, uh, well, since I myself am in the US, the, the largest number of listeners is here. Um, but after that, the largest number of listeners are in uh, the UK, followed by Australia, followed by Canada. Uh, so again, very glad to have you here. <clears throat> Please share the podcast with your friends so that... Um, we can have more of you joining us. 
And finally, a shout out to everyone who has left a, uh, a review in Apple Podcasts, including one came in just uh, earlier this month from someone named Comic Master 217 who says, uh, a must subscribe for anyone experiencing the loss of a loved one. Jenny's powerful podcast is a must have for anyone searching for support on their grief journey. Um, etc. It goes on very nice comments here. Um, bringing tremendous hope and healing to the bereaved community. So thank you so much, Comic Master 217. Um, really appreciate it. It's, it's wonderful to, to hear that the interviews and the content are helping other widowed parents um, it's, uh, that's, that's why I'm doing it after all. And also the, uh, the reviews actually help the podcast reach more people. So the way the algorithms work in Apple podcasts and Google podcasts and so forth, um, the more five star ratings and the more reviews the podcasts have, the more likely they are to show up when people are looking for things. So, um, you can leave a review if you'd like at jennylisk.com slash apple is probably the easiest way to get a, a link directly to, um, the place in Apple Podcasts or iTunes to leave a review. Or actually, if you've got Apple Podcasts on your phone, um, you should be able to do it right within there as well. And if you listen on a different platform, um, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you should be able to leave a review there as well. So, um, everyone, hey, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.